Noah's flood is myth, my first rebuttal. We now come to the first rebuttal of this debate regarding the story of Noah's flood. In this presentation, I will touch upon three things. First, I will discuss the shortcomings of Jen Fishburne's presentation regarding Noah's flood. Second, I will discuss the shortcomings in Robert Rowe's presentation of Noah, uh, regarding Noah's flood. And finally, in the midst of those two discussions, I will elaborate on a few biblical insights related to all of this. So, let's start off with Jen Fishburne and the worldwide flood. As I had done in my presentation, Jen Fishburne sought to, to present the story of Noah's flood within the larger context of Genesis 1-11. through Early on in her presentation, she gave a very creative and insightful birth analogy in her description of the creation of the world in Genesis 1, as well as using a certain amount of typology in which she equated Noah's flood with the waters of baptism. And I also appreciated her characterizing the flood story itself as a decreation story, which it obviously is. These observations and comments attempted to explain the meaning and significance of, those, of both the creation story and the Noah story and I obviously agree with them. That being said, I found her argument that Genesis 6 through 9 was about a literal historical worldwide flood four to 5,000 years ago to ultimately fall flat and not be convincing. Most of the argument was simply a combination of assertion and speculation. So let me take a quick walk through her presentation and point out some of the main problems I see. First, let's look at her one of her first statements. She says, my perspective comes from the viewpoint that the Bible is true unless we are told that it is a parable or analogy or it is obviously using a figure of speech in a particular genre. What I think she means is that her starting point is that the Bible is historical unless there is a clear indication that our particular passage is that of another genre, like a parable. After all, I share the same perspective that the Bible is true. The question regarding Genesis 1-11, through 11, though, is what genre is it, not is it true? We both agree it's true. I just think it isn't meant to be read as history. Second, I was surprised to see that she characterized the sin of Adam and Eve as being equivalent to teenagers, rebelling against their parents in order to prove how grown up they are. This is actually precisely the way I explain the sin of Adam and Eve as well in my book, The Heresy of Ham. And it is similar to how the second century church father Irenaeus sought to explain the Adam and Eve story. The difference, though, is that both Irenaeus and I argue that Adam and Eve are representative of humanity as a whole. The very name Adam means mankind. Hence, the story of Adam and Eve isn't about two literal people who lived about 6,000 years ago, who ate a literal piece of fruit from a literal tree, and thus sinned and somehow screwed everything up for the rest of us. Rather, the story of Adam and Eve is the story of humanity, both you and me. Simply put, it is not a historical account that explains where sin originally came from, but rather it is, a, it is a story that explains that even though we are made in God's image, we as human beings nevertheless sin, and we are thus in need of salvation. Third, I found Jen's take on the Nephilim to be highly problematic. She mentioned the book of Enoch and was clearly influenced by it in her interpretation of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And although it is true that Enoch depicts Genesis 6, 1 through 4, similar to the way Jen describes, the fact is that Enoch is a later intertestamental Jewish apocalyptic work, and apocalypses were certainly not works of history. They were full of symbolism and cosmic imagery, and were not intended to be read in a literal fashion. Therefore, when Peter makes the allusion to the angels who sinned in 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5, he is alluding to the book of Enoch and is using that apocalyptic work to describe the then-current crisis of false teaching in the early church at that time. He wasn't given a history lesson. And so, when Jen uses 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5 to argue that Genesis 6, 1 through 4 was telling of angels having sex with human women and producing demigods, which contaminated bloodlines, that is really stretching things, to say the least. That problematic stretch thus leads her to claim that when the Bible says Noah was blameless, that it really just meant he came from a pure bloodline, apparently with no fallen D angel DNA in him. Well, let's just ask the basic question. Does the Bible say that? And no, it obviously doesn't. It seems more likely to me that the sons of Elohim, that's the Hebrew word that can mean God or gods, it seems more likely to me that the sons of Elohim in Genesis 6-2 are not talking about angels having sex with women, although that's how it's used in Enoch, 
but rather tyrannical kings who in the ancient world claimed to be descended from the gods, abusing their power and privilege to oppress the rest of humanity. When seen in the light of Genesis 1 through 11, most notably God's creation of Adam in Genesis 2, this interpretation makes the most sense. God created mankind in his image to rule over his creation, to be a priest of his creation, and to serve his creation. In Genesis 2, we have the creation of the woman to be the equal partner to the man in this task. And yet, as a result of, an, of Adam and Eve's sin in Genesis 3, one of the consequences was that Eve would be ruled over by Adam, i.e. that men would use their power over women. And this is precisely what we see going on in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. It is a picture of rulers using their power and position to use and abuse women. Instead of using their power to care for God's creation and serve humanity, tyrants use their privilege to do the exact opposite. So, what are we to make of the Nephilim? Related to this is Jen's claim that the Nephilim were, result, were, were the result of sex between gods or angels and women. Uh, she also asks, why do we assume that all these cultures made up these stories? And she claims that the stories of the gods are vi very likely historical stories. Well, to be blunt, there simply is no evidence for those claims. Not only that, but Jen fails to recognize how the Nephilim are used throughout the Bible. That is a topic in and of itself, so I'll try to be brief. First, despite most translations that describe the Nephilim as, quote, heroes of old, warriors of renown, which makes them sound glorious in some way, the actual Hebrew reads more like mighty ones who from ages past were men for a name. On top of that, the very name Nephilim means fallen ones. This is related to what we find in Genesis 1, Genesis 11, 1 through 9, the Tower of Babel story, where the people build the tower to make a name for themselves. In both passages, the point isn't to tell of literal historical figures, but rather to illustrate the sinfulness of humanity. On top of that, the Nephilim are alluded to throughout the Old Testament. In Numbers 13:33, in the account the twelve spies give regarding Canaan, Ten spies come back and say the land is unconquerable because there are giants living in the land. The Nephilim, the sons of Anak. Later in Deuteronomy 1.28 and 9, 1 and 2, Moses reminds the Israelites when that happened and again refers to the sons of the Anakim. And again in Joshua 11.22, after Joshua takes control of Canaan, we are told that the only Anakim left in the land remained in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod. And who ended up living in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod? That's right, the Philistines. And who is the most famous Philistine of all? That's right, the giant Goliath of David and Goliath fame from Gath in 2 Samuel 17. In fact, there are actually four other mentions of these giants. They're all found in 2 Samuel 21, 15 to 22. You got Ishbi Benob, Saph, Goliath the Gittite, and a nameless giant who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. In 2 Samuel 21, 22, we are told, quote, These four were descended from the giants in Gath. They fell by the hand of David and his servants. Here's the point. Biblically speaking, the Anakim that were in the Promised Land, i.e. the Philistine giants, are associated with the mythological figures of the Nephilim in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Now, if we realize that the purpose of Genesis 1 through 11 is not to describe actual history, but to rather provide the mythological worldview lens through which, the, through which ancient Israel was to interpret history, this makes sense. Thus, the conquest itself, and later David's actions as king of God's people, the offspring of the woman, can be seen in its proper perspective. God is using his chosen people and his anointed king to fight against the offspring of the serpent. If Genesis 1-11 through 11 is seen as literal, straightforward history, then the Nephilim should have been wiped out in Noah's flood. But clearly they weren't. How did their descendants then end up in the land of Canaan during the time of Moses, Joshua, and David? I suppose you could argue that the Nephilim's DNA was transmitted through Noah's family or something like that. But when you start coming up with those type of explanations, you are starting to read into the biblical text a whole bunch of stuff the original audience would have had no clue about. So, wrapping up Jen's argument. The rest of Jen's argument covered the following points. One, the claim that Noah 
could have been an expert shipbuilder to build such a large boat. Two, uh, a brief discussion on the young earth creationist field of barominology, or barominology, created kinds. Three, a detailed explanation of the possible waste removal systems on the Ark. And four, a brief discussion of population estimates. Jen also made the point quite correctly that the flood story clearly states the entire world was flooded and that all flesh except for what survived on the Ark perished. Therefore, to argue Genesis 6 or 9 was a literal historical local flood really strains the obvious reading of the story. I, I agree there. Now, I simply cannot address all those points in detail, so I must limit myself to a few simple uh, refutations. First, the claim that Noah could have been an expert shipwright reminds me of the many could-haves found at Ken Ham's Ark Encounter. To be blunt, the Bible doesn't tell us that. Most of the arguments I have heard for Noah's Flood to be a historical event amount to speculation and a lot of could-haves, possiblys, and maybes. When you have to insert so much speculation into the biblical text to make up for the supposed historical information the text doesn't provide, maybe you should consider the possibility that the biblical text isn't trying to give historical information. Second, the young earth creationist field of barominology is not a legitimate field of science. The term baramin was made up in 1941, and the supposed scientific field of baraminology was invented by Kurt Wise in 1990. The fundamental claim that the Hebrew word min, i.e. kinds, was God's own scientific classification of pre-flood animals is simply false. Min just means kinds, as in God created all kinds of animals. The claim that it is an ancient scientific category for animals is simply absurd. It isn't. Third, the Ark Encounter also speculates on the waste removal system that could have been used. It included an elephant on a treadmill. Although imaginative, it has no basis in fact. Finally, related to the population estimates, let me expand on a few things. If one dates the flood to about 2400 BC, the Tower of Babel to about 2240 BC, and the calling of Abraham to around 2100 BC, think of everything you must insist happened within those 300 years. According to Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis, those original 2000 kinds came off the ark and proceeded to engage in an astounding rate of speciation that led to modern animals by the time Adam, by the time of Abraham, a mere 300 years later. Then, throw in a singular ice age that killed all the dinosaurs Noah brought on the ark within 100 years. And what about the Neanderthals? According to Answers in Genesis, the Neanderthals were a group of people who scattered after the Tower of Babel, that's about 2240 BC, then isolated themselves, developed a distinct genome, found and got assimilated back into the larger human population, interbred with them, and then died out. All apparently within 140 years. That is simply impossible. Now, what about Robert Rowe and the local flood? When it came to Robert Rowe's presentation, there were, as with Jen Fishburne's presentation, a few things that I agreed with. I've written extensively on Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis over the past three years, both on my blog and even in my book, The Heresy of Ham. And like Robert, I'm convinced that not only is young earth creationism and flood geology not supported by the scientific evidence, but it, that it is actually rooted in a very poor understanding of scripture itself. And thus, Robert is correct to point out that flood geology was not, is not used as a basis for any kind of scientific advancement. He is also quite correct to point out the utter impossibility for original kinds coming off the ark to speciate so rapidly in a mere 4,000 years. And let's just call it for what it is, hyper-evolution and overdrive. In fact, I think 4,000 years is too kind, for we read in the Old Testament descriptions of animals that we are familiar with today. And thus, in reality, young earth creationism requires those kinds to have evolved into current species in a thousand years or less. And again, there is simply no evidence for that whatsoever. Now, my problem with concordism. That being said, although Robert is certainly correct in pointing out that the very rise of science in the Western world came, up, came out of a distinctly Christian worldview and Christian theology, I was not convinced of his arguments for concordism and for a literal local flood. In this regard, the fundamental flaw of both his view and that of Jen Fishburne's 
is that both are trying to read modern science into the ancient biblical text. Not only is it unnecessary, but I feel it violates one of the most basic concepts of biblical inspiration. Since I believe the Bible is inspired, I believe the original intended message that God communicated to the original audience, spoken to them in their own language and culture, is the inspired message. We as Christians must do our best to understand what that original inspired message was, and then as the body of Christ, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we must seek to apply that original message to our situation today. But we shouldn't assume, in this case, when God inspired Genesis 1-11 through 11 to the original audience of ancient Israelites living in the ancient Near East, that he was really giving scientific historical answers to our modern scientific historical questions. Therefore, I simply disagree with Robert when he writes, no author writing more than 3,400 years ago could have accurately described these events and their sequence, plus the initial conditions, without divine inspiration. Because I don't believe the original author was attempting to convey scientific information to begin with. Such information would have meant absolutely nothing to the ancient Israelites because they were not living in a scientific culture and would not have been asking those questions in the first place. Simply put, the divine inspiration of Genesis 1-11 through was directly speaking to and subverting the pagan ancient Near Eastern worldview that the Isra ancient Israelites were surrounded by. It wasn't speaking to modern scientific questions. Let's take, for example, the Garden of Eden. That is why I think that his comments on how the Garden of Eden was located at the northern end of the Persian Gulf are misguided. John Walton, in both his books, uh, The Lost World of Genesis 1 and The Lost World of Adam and Eve, discusses, among other things, that the early chapters of Genesis are essentially describing the creation of the world as Yahweh's temple, with the Garden of Eden acting almost like the Holy of Holies. It was not to be seen as a literal description of an actual geographical place somewhere in Mesopotamia. The imagery of it was important, and yes, it was imbued with ancient Near Eastern concepts. It was God's royal residence, temple, on God's holy mountain, where he was to commune with the image bearers he created to act as kingly priest servants of his good creation. And it was essentially uh, the navel of his creation from which life flowed, as symbolized by the four rivers that come out of Eden to the four corners of the earth. And given that imagery, if there was one geographical place that the Jews associated with Eden, it would have been the promised land itself. Now, there are many indications of this in the Bible, but allow me to give just a couple. First, Joshua 5, 13 to 15. There is the strange scene where Joshua encounters an angel soon after the Israelites have crossed the Jordan River and are thus in Canaan. Thus, Joshua encounters an angel with a drawn sword at the edge of the promised land, just like God had placed an angel at the edge of Eden. And secondly, eventually in the biblical story, the Israelites build a temple on Mount Zion. In Ezekiel 40 to 48, there is the vision of the eschatological temple in Jerusalem, out of which would flow a river to heal the land. And we see this again in Revelation 22, when we have the vision of the new Jerusalem itself as the temple. More can be said about this, but my point is that the attempt to locate an actual piece of real estate at the north end of the Persian Gulf uh, misses the point of the Garden of Eden description entirely. Now, to the extent of the flood. As for the Noah's flood itself, let's be clear. In this case, Jen is right. In the story of Noah's flood, the flood was worldwide. And, with the exception of Noah and his family, it destroyed all humanity. I don't know how anyone could come to any other conclusion. To argue that it didn't, to argue that there was a literal flood but that it was only affected people in Mesopotamia, and that therefore there were people living in America, India, or Australia who were not affected, uh, it simply destroys the entire point of the story. Just as a host of logical problems crop up with the claim that there was a literal worldwide flood, so too do they crop up with the claim that there was a literal but only local flood. Why did Noah and his family not just move? Why was there a need to bring animals to an ark in Mesopotamia instead of just having them migrate elsewhere? No, 
I think it simply does too much violence to the text. It ignores the plain meaning of the Noah story. To read Genesis 7, 19-23, for example, where it clearly says, the waters covered the entire earth and destroyed everything that breathed, and conclude, oh, it only meant Mesopotamia, and it didn't include people and animal who, animals who were living in Australia. This is why I think the kind of concordism found in both the literal worldwide flood view and the literal local flood view simply doesn't make sense. In both cases, they are misinterpreting the genre of Genesis 1 through 11 as being that of literal history, and then are trying to come up with some sort of scientific explanation to clear away the problems that such a historical interpretation creates. Like I said in my initial presentation, if you get the genre wrong, nothing else is going to make sense. A note on Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Now, related to this is Richard's comments regarding Genesis 1, 26 and 27. He claims that it doesn't mention a single pair, and therefore could own, couldn't be about Adam and Eve. Rather, Richard believes that it is describing a pre-Adamic human population, and that it was that population that multiplied and filled the earth. There's only, there's simply one major problem with that. When it says, let us make man in our image, the Hebrew word translated as man is Adam. Adam means mankind. Therefore, to say that Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is describing a pre-Adamic population and simply doesn't make sense. These verses are pretty straightforward. God has created mankind, Adam, in his image, and thus human beings have inherent dignity and worth. What we then find in Genesis 2 and 3, though, in the figures of Adam and Eve, is another truth about human beings. We sin. The figures of Adam and Eve represent all humanity. We are Adam and Eve. Their story is our story. I want to quickly point out one more thing. Jen made the mention of the connection between Noah's Ark and the basket in which Moses was put. Uh, the same word is used for both. I think that is intentional. The writer of Exodus is couching not only Moses' salvation at his birth, but also the salvation of Israel through the Red Sea in the language used to describe creation in the flood. Hence, he is using that worldview lens of Genesis 1-11 through to describe the historical realities of the Exodus as God creates his people. But there's more to it than that. As John Salehammer points out in his book, The Pentateuch's Narrative, the purification rites in Leviticus 14 is patterned after the flood story. I will just provide a chart at the end of this presentation to look at. But the point I am making is this. It is yet another example of how Genesis 1 through 11 was used in the history of Israel. Not as history itself, but as the worldview lens that gave perspective and meaning to that history. Conclusion. There are a number of things I wanted to bring up, but that will have to wait until my next rebuttal. For now, let me just clarify my critique of both claims of my fellow debaters. The fundamental problem with both is that of concordism, the reading of the text with the assumption that it is trying to convey some sort of actual historical event, and then trying to read modern science into the biblical text. It simply is unnecessary and ends up creating more problems by injecting a whole bunch of problematic speculation into the biblical text. It is far better to just recognize the ancient genre in which Genesis 1-11 through 11 was written, and to interpret it accordingly, but not in a concordist fashion.